Okay, well, uh, we are live on Facebook and we are uh, gathered together here for our, um, our third installment of When the Heart Speaks with Vanessa Landino of Cast Iron Counseling. And Vanessa, it's again a privilege uh, to partner with you and to be able to do this. And uh, I just know that we've had such tremendous feedback from our people and um, we're really grateful for your partnership. So um, a, a few words for those of you who are joining us. Uh, of course, this is an event that is um, virtual and sponsored by St. Francis in the Fields. It is our, uh, our passion and goal to connect with you and to provide you with resources that help you walk as, as a disciple who loves um, the Lord God with all your heart, mind, body, and soul, which is to say that discipleship is holistic. <laughs> it involves all of who we are and bringing um, especially our emotions, our woundedness, and um, you know, uh, all of those emotions that we carry around uh, into the presence of God and um, placing them on his altar and learning how to walk with him and to steward those those parts of, of who we are. And um, so Vanessa has been such a gift in helping us understand that. But if you have enjoyed this series and uh, for any reason um, are interested in connecting more with us, do reach out to us. And uh, while I and the other clergy at St. Francis in the Fields are not clinically trained, we would love to connect with you and also to put you in touch, you know, perhaps with Vanessa or also with um, counselors here locally. Um, we partner with Kilgore Counseling Center, and um, and we would love to just um, provide resources for you, so do be in touch with us. But tonight's session is obviously the third and final installment of our series, and it is entitled, When the Heart Falls Silent, Understanding Depression. This is uh, truly an area of discipleship as we seek to bring all of who we are into the presence of God. And even those areas that we often are uncomfortable perhaps sharing with others. Um, but we need to be authentic. We need to be open and vulnerable about these things. And I think that um, this is a great opportunity for us to just kind of scratch the surface with Vanessa. And uh, perhaps this will start a conversation in our community. So Vanessa, why don't you take it away? It's again, a great privilege to have you. Thank you for your partnership. Uh, thanks, Clint. Um, hi, everybody. It's wonderful to be with you again. Um, it's such an honor to be invited to share these thoughts with you. Um, you know, the body of Christ is the family of God. And in that family, God meets our needs, um, be they spiritual, physical, emotional, um, psychological. And so tonight, what we're going to talk about is a very vulnerable place that we find ourselves as humans, as Christians, as the family of God. And I want to thank Clint for one of the gifts of the many gifts that Clint has is um, the way that he articulates discipleship. And what struck me that he just said was that it's holistic, that we bring our body, our mind, our heart, our spirit, everything we are into the presence of God. So two weeks ago, we talked about emotional health, what it is in general, why God gave us emotions, how they show up in the body, what they're for. And then last week, we really dove into, well, what do we do with them, right? And, and emotions are the language of connections. We talked about how we use our emotions to connect to ourselves by knowing what we're feeling, by being able to give words to our internal world. And then we talked about how to connect with God, bringing ourselves into a vulnerable place with God by really expressing to God what we feel. And working through the shame and the fear and the guilt that we have about our feelings, right? We talked about that middle level of emotions called meta-emotion. Meta-emotion are the feelings we have about our feelings. Tonight, what we're going to focus on is a place in the human spirit that has a number of terms in the spiritual world. One of them would be the dark night of the soul. We're going to talk about depression. What happens when the emotions in us become blocked and bundled into a feeling of sadness and a heavy 
mood um, in a in a in a in a way that that lasts that's persistent because everybody goes through moods and everybody goes through systems and seasons of melancholy um, but when it persists when we can't pull ourselves out of it the word that we use for that clinically is depression okay so tonight we're going to take a look at that and then we're going to talk about the hope of how God's hand can reach into us in those dark places and bring light where there is darkness and heal us and give us new life and new hope on the other side. And we'll wrap it up with that, all right? So give me just a moment while I share my screen with you. Oh, Amy, I think you have to let me share it. Folks, give me just a second and we'll get it right. Amy, if you can make me a host, I think that'll do it. There we go. Okay. Give me just a second, guys. We're going to pull this up. Okay. All right. Um, so here we are, our third installment. When the heart speaks and when it falls silent, understanding depression. Let's dive in together. And my prayer tonight is that we would allow ourselves to be vulnerable in our own hearts. As I talk through this, you may have a lot of feelings and you may think about family members and that this may feel very resonant with you. Oh, you know, Aunt Nancy was depressed or my mother was depressed. My father, I'm depressed. My child is depressed. My friend is depressed. Hold that very gently within you. And we're going to walk through this carefully because it's a very sensitive subject matter. And there's so much hope. There's so much reason for hope. And I'm gonna share some stories with you at the end that my clients gave me permission to share um, about depression that had been largely resolved and healed in, in ways that freed the sufferer to live their life with joy again. So let's get into it and let's open our hearts to this together. So here are the, objection, the objectives for tonight, okay? The immediate objective is to identify the, sign, the signs and symptoms of depression. That's one of them. Whether it's in yourself or someone else, we wanna know what that looks like. And then to learn how to speak openly with others when we feel depressed, when we sense that they are depressed. So we're gonna take those tools that we talked about last week, right? Validation, listening, empathizing, showing compassion. We're gonna take those relational emotional tools and we're gonna learn how to apply them when someone's feeling depressed. What's my long-term objective for you? To understand the root causes of depression and participate actively in preventative self-care. Just like you know, here we are in COVID times, right? And we know that the virus is spread um, from, you know, germs that we might have on our hands. We touch our noses, our eyes, our mouths. It's aerosolized. So we know that if somebody sneeze on, sneezes on me and I'm not wearing a mask or it's not six feet distance that I might risk getting the, the virus. So we know how to take precautions to keep ourselves healthy. And we do that all the time. We, you know, get a flu shot in flu season, or we, um, you know, don't eat spicy foods if we're given toward um, irritable bowel syndrome or whatever it is. We take preventative care of ourselves physically. I want to keep reminding us gently that we can do this emotionally. We can get on the side of emotional health so that we're not walloped by things like depression and anxiety. And then also long-term, how do we build safe community? So we're gonna talk about that as well. Okay, why talk about depression? Why did you know, Father Clint ask us to look at this? Well, it's all around us. Let's look at some statistics together. 17.3 million American adults are diagnosed with MDD, major depressive disorder. More women than men are diagnosed. 1.9 million children are diagnosed with depression. Remember, there's a lot of hope. We're going to get to it. 
adults with depression have a 64% greater risk of developing coronary artery disease. Remember we talked two sessions ago about the connection between stress, emotional stress and illness. The studies are in, the science is definitive, stress and illness are related. So we're not just talking about emotional care tonight, we're talking about the care of the holistic person, right? Depression is the leading cause of disability worldwide and is the single greatest contributor to the overall burden of disease. It's a big problem, it's prevalent. Upwards of 80 people who seek treatment for depression experience relief within four to six weeks of beginning treatment. And I'll share some stories, like I said, at the end of our time tonight. Lots of hope, but it's a big issue. We need to look at it together. Why should we talk about depression? Well, depression is connected to suicide and suicide is the 10th leading cause of death in the US. Now this is the CDC of last year. These are their statistics from last year. It's not looking great, okay? 47,000, this is what the CDC documented, 47,173 people committed suicide last year, took their own lives. Those people were depressed and they were hopeless, many of them. So over 47,000 people died from suicide, 1.4 million people attempted suicide two years ago. Okay, that's the American Federation of Suicide Prevention, that's AFSP, that's the statistic you're looking at. Now, let's get real, because, you know, Clint and I walked through this up close and personal a few years ago. The highest rate of suicide occurs in white, middle class, and I will add middle-aged men. Brothers, I'm appealing to your hearts tonight. You have to start talking. You need to start talking about what you feel and what you're going through. The people in your life need to learn how to allow you to be weak. They need to learn how to hold your strength and your protection in one hand and your vulnerability and your tenderness in the other. We all need to grow in this together. Men are socialized to not show emotion and to be strong all the time. And they are the highest vulnerable population for suicide. We have to grow and it starts here in the church. On average, there are 132 suicides per day. Men die from suicide almost four times more frequently than women. Women attempt more men complete more. 90% of those who die of suicide have existing mental illnesses or a substance abuse problem. I would venture to say that almost all of them are depressed. Okay, so it's very important that we talk about this and we understand it. We need to get past the stigma. We need to get past the fear and the shame. Remember the meta emotion, the shame. I'm really sad, but I'm ashamed to talk about it. I feel overwhelmed in my life, but I'm ashamed to talk about it. We gotta push past that meta emotion and get to self-expression. Okay, so these are just some statistics we don't have to read through everyone about how many people die by age group. So we see one in 100,000, 10 to 14, that's alarming. Seven in 100,000, 15 to 19. 12, about 13 in 100,000, 20 to 24. Second leading cause of death for 15 to 25 year old Americans. Second, I think the first is car accidents. Suicide is the fourth leading cause of death for adults 18 to 65, okay. So we talked about this, males complete suicide about four times higher than females. Firearms are usually what men use to complete suicide. Access to firearms is associated with that. Females are more likely than males to have suicidal thoughts, to be depressed and to attempt suicide. Females mostly try with poisoning. Men mostly try with firearms, which is why men complete suicide so much more frequently than women. Okay, what does it sound like? And I wanna keep saying this because I know that this is a difficult subject matter. There will be hope. There is hope, but we need to walk through this together and we need to open our hearts to the reality of the depth of human pain. What does depression sound like? Well, let's listen to depressed people in their own words. Have pity on me, O oh Lord, because I am in distress. My eyes, my soul, and my body waste away from grief. My life is exhausted from sorrow, my years from groaning. My strength staggers under the weight of my guilt. 
and my bones waste away. I have faded from memory as if I were dead and I have become like a piece of broken pottery. A man named David wrote that and it's recorded in the Psalms. The depressed in their own words, my soul is filled with troubles and my life comes closer to the grave. I am numbered with those who go into the pit. I am like a man without any strength. I'm shut in and I can't get out. My eyes grow weak because of my suffering. Ever since I was young, I have been suffering and near death. And we're gonna talk about root causes. We're gonna talk about childhood, okay? I have endured your terrors and now I'm in despair. Darkness is my only friend. A son of Korah. This is Psalm 88. It's the only Psalm in the Bible that ends on a very, very negative note. In their own words, I'm so upset that I cannot speak. I have considered the days of old, the years long ago. I remember my song in the night and reflect on it. My spirit searches for an answer. Asaph. I've had enough now, Lord. Take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. Elijah. Mortals are weighed down with a terrible burden that God has placed on them. I have seen everything that is done under the sun. Look at it. It's all pointless. It's like trying to catch the wind. Solomon. Cursed is the day that I was born. The day that my mother gave birth to me, may it not be blessed. Cursed is the man who made my father very happy with the news that he had just become the father of a baby boy. May that man be like the cities that the Lord destroyed without pity. May he hear a cry of alarm in the morning and a battle cry at noon. Hear the hatred. Hatred for everybody. Even the man who announced my birth. I hate him. Okay. If only he had killed me while I was in the womb. Then my mother would have been my grave, and she would have always been pregnant. Why did I come out of the womb? All I've seen is trouble and grief. I will finish my days in shame. Jeremiah. We've got a nickname for Jeremiah. You know, we call Jeremiah the weeping prophet. And we read these words thousands of years after they, was, they were written. But thousands of years ago, a man sat in anguish, anguish, and wrote these words. Why was I born? I wish I'd been stillborn. Dark, very sad, very depressed. How do you feel right now? It's heavy, right? There's hope. There's lots of hope. Let's talk about the signs and symptoms of depression, okay? The most obvious is persistent feelings of sadness, tearfulness, emptiness, and hopelessness. Okay, people who are depressed have lost their joy. There could be angry outburst, irritability, and frustration over seemingly small triggers. So we heard some of that in Solomon's words, of course, from Ecclesiastes, and in the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah's lament. Okay, um, there's, a, there's a sense of like, I, I can't deal with life anymore. The smallest things put me over the edge. Our tolerance, our window of tolerance for what we can handle goes from real wide to about this big. And when I'm working with someone in depression, you'll see that, that even the littlest things will trigger them. And there's a hyper excitability in their mood. Even though their mood is low and their, 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 their mood is sad, it's very excitable. Okay. And in advanced stages of depression, it's flat. And I'm going to tell you a story at the end of tonight about a client who was flat and the journey of watching that man find his joy again. Lost of interest or pleasure in most or all activities, work, sex, hobbies, or sports, just nothing brings any joy. There's no motivation to do it. The things that we had energy to do do not motivate us anymore. Sleep disturbances, including insomnia, sleeping too much, either one. People who are depressed can't sleep through the night, but yet they want to crawl under the covers all day long. Okay, that's a typical, typical experience in depression. Tiredness, lack of energy, even small tasks take extra effort. Um, get, getting in the shower, brushing your teeth, 
making coffee. Little things that we do every day when you're depressed, it is like climbing a mountain. Reduced appetite, weight loss, or increased food cravings, food and waking, okay? Anxiety, anxiety very often goes hand in hand with depression. Part of the anxiety comes from we don't know how long we're going to fear this way, feel this way and there's a fear involved. Remember that anxiety is very often fear. There's a fear of what if I never feel like myself again? What if this goes on forever? So we can be very agitated and restless in that fear. Slowed thinking, the brain is slowing down, speaking, body movements, it's all slowing down. And then we have the emotional piece. We have deep feelings of worthlessness, guilt, we ruminate, okay? The brain does not stop thinking about all the things it's done wrong, all the regrets it has in life. Now there's a very functional way to deal with the experience of regret. Whenever I meet someone and they say, oh, I have no regrets, you know these people, very carefree, free spirits, I have no regrets. Yeah, you do. Who doesn't have regrets? But when we're oriented in the past around regret, we have choices, we can either learn forgive ourselves, accept God's grace so that we are free and we learn the lesson and we allow it to grow us. When you're depressed, that's not what happens. You sit in the guilt and you ruminate on it and you ruminate on it and you look at all the misery in the present and you think it's your fault. So there's an excessive feeling of guilt and personal responsibility for many, many things. Trouble thinking, concentrating, making decisions, and remembering things. When we're depressed, we can't even trust our own intuition. We don't know what we want. It's very, very hard to make choices. Frequent or recurrent thoughts of death, suicidal thoughts, suicide attempts, or suicide. Okay, so when you're getting to the point where the depressed person is thinking, um, I want to take my own life, the pain is so great, and I don't see hope. Now, this is a very, very important part of a very depressed person, okay? Depression can creep up or it can come on quickly. We're gonna talk about some triggers later on in our talk tonight. But when somebody loses hope, that's when suicidality sets in. That's a very, very dangerous place for a human being to be at a loss of hope. I'm gonna talk about how to restore that. Unexplained physical problems, back pain or headaches. Again, that connection between the body and the spirit the physical person and the emotional person can't be undone. Okay, so um, we're gonna focus just a little bit on what depression looks like in children and teens. It looks very, very similar. Um, what you're looking at in kids and teens are outbursts. Anger, aggression, destructive behavior, hitting themselves, kicking, biting, headbanging, all of that is letting you know that there's an emotional state inside that is so intense they don't know how to express it. Um, you're going to look at continued disobedience, right, uh, to the point of being um, oppositional, right, uh, harming animals, any kind of infliction of pain on the self or somebody else. It's getting the hurt out, okay? They're processing the hurt out and inflicting other things, eating, sleeping. In younger children, bedwetting, constipation, or diarrhea, the gut is, many, many holistic doctors will call the gut your second brain. Okay, there's neurons in the gut. The gut is very, very sensitive to whatever we're feeling emotionally. So if there are issues with digestion, we wanna take a look at the emotional state of the child. Impulsiveness, accident prone. And then again, those physical symptoms. Remember that the body is a holistic thing. So if there's a problem in the spirit or the heart, you're gonna see it in the body, okay? Pulling out hair, eyelashes. This is all, that's called trichotillomania. Um, these are all anxiety producing, uh, anxiety, um, Dis, uh, disturbances and, and behaviors associated with depression. So breaking that down emotionally, children are frustrated, they're crying, they've got low self-esteem, um, cognitive, they can't pay attention, they can't focus. Um, there's lots and lots and lots of research on ADD and ADHD, but what I would like to present tonight is the idea that a lot of kids that are getting diagnosed with this are depressed. Um, and we need to look at that because we are diagnosing an entire generation and we're medicating them as well. And we need to be very, very careful that we're actually hitting what's going on. If this is a depressive episode, we need to address the heart and not just the brain with medication. And we're going to talk about that. And then the verbal signs, if they're talking about suicide, you need to get in there pretty quickly or disorganized speech. Okay. Risk factors of suicide. Again, if you're depressed, Okay, addiction and, and depression are very closely linked. We're gonna talk about that. 
if there have been suicide attempts, the rate of suicide goes up. We call it suicide contagion, okay? If there's access to methods, firearms, poison, or maladaptive co coping strategies. So what do we mean? Um, let's say that I have a wall in my house and it had a lot of wa water damage or structural damage and it's collapsing in on the house, okay? So I run and I get a coffee table and I turn it upright and I'm trying to hold up, hold up a wall with a coffee table. How long is that gonna last? Not very long. So then I run and I get a two by four and I'm trying to hold up a wall with a two by four. Eh, maybe I get three or four and I've got, I've got some structural pressure pressing against that wall that wants to collapse, but it's not gonna hold on for very long. What I'm doing is I'm just jerry rigging, right? I'm not fixing the problem. I'm just trying to hold it up, trying to hold the structure up. When we are depressed, when we have unresolved issues, we're gonna talk a lot about the root causes of depression from, a, from an emotional lens. Okay. When we have, when we're depressed and we cope by working excessively, okay, work, staying busy, compulsive helping. I never feel my own pain because I'm always helping other people. Uh, or we use drugs and alcohol, or we use sex or relationships, or we use religion. Okay. This is called a spiritual bypass. And this is why your emotional life and your prayers is so important because we can be so spiritual Come on, guys, we know we do this. We're so spiritual. We're so much like Jesus, as if Jesus wasn't emotional. He was and is. But we're so religious and we're so pious that we just don't feel unpleasant emotion. No. We're setting ourselves up for mood disorders. And we're also not creating a, a, an environment of compassion. What is compassion, if not the ability to move toward another person in their pain? But if we don't feel pain, then we're going to have a very hard time sitting with other people in their pain. And so we create an entire situation where everybody is spiritually bypassing their own pain. They're bypassing their own life. They're bypassing their own emotions. And all of this increases the risk factors of suicide. We have now a culture, a community that leads to a culture of people who will not feel pain. Very dangerous, but these are risk factors. Now in adolescence, I want to say a word about this. In adolescence, what you have in a risk factor is you have life events that for adults are not that big of a deal. For example, my boyfriend broke up with me, my girlfriend broke up with me, or I flunked a test. And what we do when, when, when kids talk to us about these things, we minimize their world and we invalidate them in the process. So when we have a teenager who's absolutely wrecked because they didn't get asked to the prom, Oh, honey, come on. There, you're going to have plenty of opportunities in life to get invited to things. There's plenty of fish in the sea. Oh, don't worry. Why don't we have a sleepover for your friends instead? Okay. This is like for a teenager. Remember that this is their world. The world is still small. This is like a, a bride at 28, 30, whatever, 25, 24, whatever. She uh, is left on the, at the altar on her wedding day. Oh, honey, come on. You'll meet somebody else. Would you do that? No. We would be crushed because we realize how big that is. But when our teenager comes to us and they're crushed, we say, you'll be fine. No, we need to validate it because the world of a child is small and the world of a teenager is not that big. It's only expanded to their home and their high school, really. They haven't traveled the world. They may have been to a state or another country, but their world is small. And so the things that happen in their world is small. Um, when I first did this talk, I did it at a church here in Nashville, and they had a teenage suicide, and it was tragic. And I gave these talks to the church, and I had so many people that came up to me. It was as if they were all reading from the same script. It was interesting. Everybody kept saying the same phrase to me. They kept saying, he had so many advantages. We can't imagine he would have done this. He had so many advantages. And this was in a very wealthy area of Nashville. And I'm sure he did. And what I would say in response is, did anyone validate his pain? Because this kid doesn't know that he has so many advantages. I'm assuming he's never been or spent any extended period of time in the third world. So his very affluent life was the only world he knew. But the pain was still real. So when children say things to us like this happened and that happened and I'm just so heartbroken and I didn't get this or I didn't get that and we immediately go to, you know, well, there are starving children in India, right? We minimize their pain, we invalidate their feeling. What we need to do instead is 
I get it. That's really hard. It's a loss for you. And I get it. We have to validate their world because their world is small, right? Okay. Noticing in adolescence, stressful life events are breakups, testing pressure, bullying. That's going to come in at the end of our talk tonight. I'm going to tell you a story about that. Abuse and neglect. For adults, it's, bi it's bigger because the world is bigger. It's financial, it's family, it's marital crises, health, addiction, those kinds of things. Okay. We talked about suicide contagion, sexual orientation. This is a huge risk factor for suicide. Okay. So what do I do if someone I love is depressed? Well, let's talk about it. Let's start with physical health. What do you see on the left? This, this lovely girl, she's in pain, right? She looks stressed. She looks worried. Something's going on. She's rubbing her temples. Okay, same, same situation on the right. These people are physically giving us the signs of pain, physical pain. What do you see? What would you say? Hey, are you okay? Does your head hurt? All right, so we notice and we ask, you all right? Do you, need a, do you need a Tylenol? Do you need some water? Do you need to lay down? Are you okay? So we see the physical discomfort and we move toward physical remedy, physical palliative care. Okay. So we notice, we ask, and then we listen. Same with depression. I saw you sitting alone. How are you feeling? Are you okay? I noticed that you've been really quiet lately. Is everything okay? Sometimes we're in the most, sometimes we're the most quiet when we need to talk. I'm here to listen if you need. Okay. These are all ways that you can create a community where we notice right? We're, we're, we're watching the family around us, the family of God. We're noticing who's not okay, who's not. And if we're in a better place, then we have eyes and ears to do that. And sometimes when we're even depressed, we have eyes and ears to do that because our hearts are so attuned to it. You haven't been yourself. Are you okay? Is something going on? I know you're coping with a lot right now. What's that been like for you? Okay. We don't avoid pain. We move toward it. And we have a wonderful model. Jesus didn't avoid pain, and why? Because he could heal it. Jesus knew how to sit with people in pain. When they were in emotional pain, he wept with them. When they were in physical pain, he had the power to heal them. When we feel confident that we can move, move into pain with effective ways of being, then we won't avoid it. We'll be able to look at our brother or our sister who's struggling, who's depressed, and can say, talk, talk to me, what's going on? Do you need to be alone? How about I just sit with you and we don't talk? I'll be in the other room reading. I just don't want you to be alone. Okay, people who are depressed tend to isolate. And if, if they're open to it, we can break through that gently, okay? Here's some, some responses that are unhelpful and actually dangerous reactions to depression. And why are they dangerous, Vanessa? Well, because when people are depressed, they're isolating anyway. There's a lot of shame associated with depression and a lot of, um, inward inward activity meaning it's not coming out they're not talking they're not emoting they're thinking they're ruminating they're worrying they're feeling guilty and ashamed and all the things that are going on inside so that can get worse pretty quickly if they receive invalidating responses so what is not helpful impatience focusing on outcome over process what do i mean you'll be fine you just need to get some help okay that's not helpful what we need to do is say, you know, this is going to be a road for you. I want you to know that I'm walking with you on it. Okay. Hyper hope. Pollyanna syndrome. I think we talked about this a couple weeks ago. Pollyanna. Maybe we didn't. But Pollyanna, remember the movie, for those of us who are a little bit older, uh, Haley Mills, I think, played um, this, this, this adorable orphan who brought love and joy to this miserable town just by being her cheerful self. Okay, that's a movie. It's Hollywood. That's not true. It's a nice story. And sometimes you know, the innocence and the bright eyed, beautiful, innocent energy of a child can can turn the mood. But in general, nobody wants a Pollyanna. It's exhausting. Some of us are toxic in our optimism. Toxic. Cheerfulness. It's hyper hope. It's not helpful. What we need to do instead is validate and empathize. There's a place where we can offer hope, but we have to validate the pain first. Ill-placed humor. You cannot laugh your way out of depression. Do not try and cheer somebody up with jokes. No, not helpful. Spiritualization. Shaming, moralizing, or preaching. Well, if you would just put your hope in God. How's your prayer life? I mean, this is practical atheism if you don't think that God can help you. Not helpful. 
Jesus did not do this with people who were in deep, dark, emotional pain. He wrapped his arms around them. He didn't blame them. Over, oversimplification and pat answers. Well, it'll be okay. This is one of my favorite. Guys, please don't ever say this again. God's in control. First of all, and, and, and Father Clint is far more poised and prepared and anointed to do this than I am. But theologically, I've got some problems with that because control is not love. So that answer is not helpful. What is helpful is remembering Romans 8 that God can and does work everything together for good. Not everything is good. Some things are downright terrible, awful, but God can work everything together for good. And that's the process, not the outcome. It's being in the process. Over or underestimating one's capacity to help. Don't underestimate yourself. Sometimes your presence is just exactly what's needed, but also don't overestimate. Know when to refer to someone to a professional. Know when to offer a safe place simply to listen. And then really dismissal. Oh, you take things too personally. You're too sensitive. No. I'm hearing what you're saying, and I'm taking you seriously right now. You're in a lot of pain, and I want you to know that I'm here and I care for you, and I'm willing to pray with you, and I will definitely be praying for you. Okay, we take people seriously when they're in pain. We don't dismiss it, especially kids, because what they'll do is they'll just shut down. And adults do the same thing, but it's very dangerous for children. Okay, healthy responses. Accept the depressed person's mental state. Believe them. If they're miserable, believe them. If they don't wanna talk, believe them. Tend to your own emotions. It is normal, and we're gonna get into this in a second, it is very normal to feel a lot in the presence of depression, confusion, disappointment, abandonment, anger, sadness, and fear. All of that is normal. Being in the presence of dep depression is very difficult. It's very difficult, okay? We feel helpless, we feel hopeless. We have to take care of that ourselves. Remember the I in, in, in the basics with emotions. I am responsible for my feelings. So just because I feel hopeless and helpless doesn't mean I'm allowed to compulsively try and cheer another person up so that I don't have to deal with my own powerlessness in this situation. No, I need to take that to God in prayer. God, I feel powerless to help my wife or my child. Please walk me through this and unite us as a family in this time, okay? Encourage someone to, to seek professional help. If this is persisting, if this is going on for months, we need to look at help. Okay, validate their emotional state. Don't try to cheer them up or talk them out of it. There are root causes. We're gonna dive in in just a second and pray. Pray with and pray for. Okay, those are healthy responses to the person who's depressed. Normal reactions to depression. If you're not depressed and you're hearing it, it can be exhausting. Sometimes you wanna say, come on, shake yourself out of it. It's, it's not helpful, they can't. It's not something that has settled that can be shaken off. It's something that's settled that needs to be worked through gently and slowly. It's normal to fear, feel vicarious grief or sorrow. Vicarious just means you're feeling it and I'm feeling it with you. Okay, your pain is affecting me, now I'm in pain, right? We long for light, levity, hope, and optimism. And this is very normal if you're living with someone who's depressed. There can feel like there's a dark cloud in the room. And we long for the days where we used to laugh together where we would make future plans, where we had hope together, they'll come back. They'll come back. If the person is getting good help and we're walking through it with compassion, we can, we can long and we can have hope as well. It's normal to feel frustrated because you can't fix it. It's normal to feel pressured to find and produce an answer that will work and alleviate the suffering. No, you didn't cause it and you can't fix it. It's normal to feel confused, right? We were, we, were, we were here and we had a happy life and we had a happy family or you were a happy kid and now we're here. What in the world happened? Confusion is normal. It's our job to actually learn what happened and figure it out and start to, to, to trace the pathway of depression. And it's normal to feel hopeless. The state of the depressed person can overtake us. We just feel like, now I'm depressed too. Okay, these are all normal reactions. We'll work through them. Let's talk about root causes. 
Okay. Now, there's a lot of opinions on this, and there's not actually a whole lot of science, to be honest, but there's a lot of opinions in the mental health field. And I'm going to look at three different root causes. Trauma could have happened in the present or the past. Okay. What is trauma? What is this, this word that we use all the time? Well, it's any event that surpasses our ability to successfully cope and changes how we see ourselves in the world. That's all it is, okay? Um, it could happen one time. For example, a rape would be traumatizing, changes uh, a person's sexual sense of themselves. Um, and that's a very obvious trauma. That's very, very um, drastic and violent. Um, trauma can also be, and we, we use this, this phrase in my field a lot, death by a thousand cuts. If we had a critical parent um, who always found fault with everything we did, nothing was good enough. We were never good enough. We were not praised. We, our parents were not proud of us unless we did things their way, right? A very perfectionistic critical parent. That is also trauma because it changes the way we see ourselves and no child can cope with that. No child has a voice to say, you know, mom, you're really being critical or dad, you're being too hard on me. They don't have that. They're, they're just going to shut down, go in, and that will inflict trauma. And it could have happened to us or we could be doing it. And we need to look at that. But that's what trauma is. It's any event that's too big to cope with and it changes the way we see ourselves in the world. If it's unhealed, what do we mean by unhealed trauma? We mean it's not processed and unintegrated. Sometimes in therapy, when I meet a new client and they've had trauma in their past, they'll tell me about it like they're telling me what they had for lunch. Okay, and I know that when they're talking about it that way, I mean, there's literally no emotion involved. Yeah, I mean, I remember the time my dad picked me up out of bed while I was sleeping and threw me on the floor. That was crazy. That was a wacky night. And as a clinician, you sit there and you think, oh boy, that is unhealed trauma. How's that showing up in their adult life? Okay, now again, that's a very violent, drastic um, example. Trauma could be something that a, a parent or someone, a teacher, anybody says in a moment when we're a kid and inside we shatter. And maybe right now you're thinking, oh yeah, I remember that. One comment can traumatize us. We are so tender hearted. We are so sensitive that yes, the human heart is that delicate. Yeah. Self-beliefs become skewed and they become false. I'll share a little bit from my story. Um, I had a very mean grandmother. She was just a pill. If you've ever seen Steel Magnolias, uh, she reminded me of Weezer. And um, she would just say things that were extremely hurtful. And she just kind of shot from the hip. She was from the greatest generation. She was born and raised on a 2000 acre peanut farm in Georgia. So I have Southern roots even though I'm a yank, um, but she was just kind of mean and she didn't have a whole lot of sensitivity around us. And I remember just sitting at the table once and I'm one of four kids, I'm the fourth. And she looked at me just in front of my entire family and she said, uh, you know, Vanessa, your parents only wanted three children. Now, why you would tell a child that I have no idea. Um, and I burst into tears as a child would do. And my father, you know, mom, why are you saying that to her? And my mother, of course, you know, my mother had a very thick Colombian accent and she, I, why are you saying this to Vanessa? You know, she was darling. But the moment, of course, I processed it and I've, I've done therapy around that. And there were many other moments like that with her. But at this point, I can laugh about it. And it's not coming from a place of callous cynicism. It's coming from a place of just integration. My grandmother's been gone for many years. I forgive her. I love her. She had a hard upbringing. She, she was born and raised in the Great Depression. Um, she didn't have a sensitivity about her, and I see all of that now, but at the time, I might have been a young teen when she said that. It was shattering, okay? What did it create in me? It created a belief that I was unwanted, and I carried that belief for a very long time, and it still crops up, it still crops up, and she said other things that reinforced that, but that's what I'm talking about. When you have a moment like that, you know, my parents probably did say, oh, shake it off. She didn't mean anything. And they meant well. But nobody validated like, hey, that really hurt you, didn't it? Vanessa, that's not true. Okay. I sat with it and I developed a belief that I wasn't wanted in my family. So then the adult life is now built on the traumatized self. 
So I personally, again, this is my story, I developed all these behaviors that would make me very um, attractive to people. It, it, would make, it would make them want me around. I tried to make myself very, very um, distinct and kind of sparkly and shiny and exceptional in a lot of ways so that people would want me around because really, really deep down in me, I had this belief from this trauma and there were other things that contributed to it that I wasn't wanted, okay? So when I got into adulthood, you can fool people for long. Remember that wall that's collapsing? Those two by fours are gonna hold up for a while, but eventually the coping mechanisms don't work. So what happens? We might become depressed, and I did. So we have trauma, and the trauma creates extreme pain, and we develop coping strategies. By the way, this is where addictions are born. They're born out of pain that has not been processed. The addiction is not the problem. The addiction is the two by four. It's a terrible coping mechanism. Okay, sidebar. This is gonna give us some compassion for people who are in addiction. It's just a bad coping strategy. It doesn't mean you're a bad person. It's just, it's not an effective coping strategy. It'll medicate the pain because the trauma causes extreme pain. It'll medicate the pain, but the wall's gonna collapse, right? Remember that two by four, it's not gonna work. So we have a change in self-concept because of this trauma. Now we're living from a false self, which means we're disconnected from the true self. What does that lead to? Depression, how could it not? We are made to be authentic. But when my authentic self was traumatized, silenced, shut down, shut up, I'm so disconnected from my true feelings, which are part of the true self, that I've become this fake person. I've become this role instead of a person. Of course I'm depressed. That's not how we're meant to live. Depression is actually a sign that something along this has gone wrong. So as difficult and as painful as it is, we can be thankful for it. Because just like an ache in the body tells us that something is wrong, an ache in the spirit tells us that something has happened and it's not healed. Same thing. Root cause, also abuse. Now abuse is a type of trauma, but it's a different type. It's a different thing altogether. Trauma could be the loss of a parent. That's not abuse. Trauma could be divorce. That's not abuse. Okay, what is abuse? And I should have added the, uh, the definition, but I'll do it now, okay? Abuse is any time that we use our power or anybody uses their power in an effort to control another person to meet their own needs. That is abuse. It's broad and a lot of things fall under that category. What does abuse do? Well, it shatters our sense of safety. Okay. When we talk about basic human needs, and we talked about this last week and the week before, we have an inherent basic need to feel safe in our environment. When you are abused in any way, physically, emotionally, sexually, verbally, psychologically, spiritually, that is a thing, financially, that is a thing, okay, any type of abuse shatters your sense of safety in your world, particularly when you're young. When you're old, you have more agency, you have more resources, okay? You can, you can get yourself to a safe place. When you're young, you have no options. If you're abused where you are, that is where you stay. So it shatters safety. And again, it alters our self-concept. When you abuse, um, for example, I use this, this analogy a lot with my clients. If there's a priceless painting on the wall and I take, um, you know, a milkshake and I shake it up and I throw it on the painting, and then I rip the painting off the wall and I stomp on it and I rip it up and I pour mud all over it and then I spit on it. Okay, I have abused something of great value. Does that mean that the painting itself before the abuse had no value? No, the painting was of inestimable value. Think about the Mona Lisa, right? The painting had perfect value. What was done to it makes us view it as worthless. And the same is true of us. When we have been abused, we are of inestimable value. We're made in the image of God. We're divine beings who carry soul and spirit in our physical bodies. What a miracle we are. When we are abused, 
we look at ourselves like that painting on the floor, worthless, unloved, unlovable, disgusting, dirty. Why? Because we were treated as if we have no value. That doesn't mean we don't have value. It means we were treated by wounded people as if we had no value. So it destroys our ability to trust. We can't form successful adult att attachments. And what does that do? We don't really trust anyone to really know us. We are chronically lonely. Who wouldn't be depressed? Makes sense, right? So now we have a different flow chart. Abuse leading to low self-esteem. I don't see myself as the priceless work of art that I am. I see myself as the abused piece of art on the floor. We distrust other people because I'm no longer safe. That leads to a low to no ability to trust, low to no real attachments. Remember we talked last week how important relationships are. We're made for it. Relationship with self, others, and God. Well, abuse affects my relationship with myself because now I think I'm worthless. It affects my relationships with other people because I can't trust anybody not to hurt me. And it might affect my relationship with God because if God is sovereign, why did this happen? right? It, it affects every part of us. We're chronically lonely. We get depressed. And without help, we don't know how to fix any of this. Is it a chemical imbalance? We don't know. What came first, the chicken or the egg? The trauma, the abuse, or the imbalance? We don't know. But what we do know is that when people have lived in very, very skewed states, of self-concept. What do I mean by that? I'm worthless. Nobody loves me. Nobody really knows me. If they did, they wouldn't love me. Does that create a chemical imbalance in the brain? It very well could. But there is no scientific proof that depression is due to a chemical imbalance. Not as of now. It doesn't exist. That science has not been proven. But what we do know is that the effects of trauma and abuse, all if that's unresolved, our bodies and our souls are not meant to live in that. Depression will be the sign. It'll be the signal that something's wrong and it needs to be healed. So we need to pay attention to it and not see it as though there's something wrong with us. There's actually something right. Your beautiful mind created by God is giving you a, it's giving you a signal. You need to heal. Something has been wounded and broken in you and it needs to be healed. Okay. So let's look at the care models of depression. I might go over a little bit tonight, but I'm going to try and get it all in, okay? The medical model, it's, it's, a, it's like visiting the doctor. When you go to see a psychiatrist or your, um, your, your general doctor, they're going to analyze the symptoms. You know, are you having trouble sleeping, weight loss, weight gain? Are you sad? Are you having suicidal thoughts? They're going to go all through those symptoms of depression. They're going to make a diagnosis. They're going to prescribe medication. And alternate therapies may or may not be recommended. So they may say you should go see a counselor. You might want to see a therapist. Some psychiatrists do talk therapy. Most don't, but they may recommend it. Some will just write you a script and send you on your way. That's inadequate, and I'm going to talk about that. They may, may re recommend group therapy. And in um, extreme cases of therapy, they may say TMS, which is uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation, or ECT, electroconvulsive therapy, or ways of shocking the brain to try and sort of reset the mood. Those are in cases of severe depression. But again, this is the medical model, so they're going to be looking at medical interventions. Okay, let's talk about the psychotherapeutic model. Psychotherapists, of course myself, we're going to analyze the symptoms. We may diagnose you. Some of us don't. I don't bother with diagnoses most of the time. I don't think they're useful. Um, when people ask me, how do you diagnose your clients? I will say 99% of the time, my diagnosis is a broken heart. They did not receive the love they needed either in the past or they're not receiving it in the present and all of their symptoms are coming from not being loved. So we need to get you back into a love zone, okay? So we're gonna take a detailed history, your spiritual history, your emotional, your parental, is there a traumatic history, your mental health history, addiction history, attachment history. We're gonna look at different inventories. Was there trauma? Was there abuse? What beliefs did you develop as a result of this? We're gonna analyze those early childhood experiences looking for unhealed wounds, resulting self-concept. How did you walk away from this? Did you walk away from this hardened, right? Some of us don't go to the worthless place consciously. It's 
deep down in there. But what we do is we build walls on top of it of ego. Well, I'm successful. I mean, I don't know who feels worthless. I mean, God, you got to get over yourself. Just work hard. Do something with your life. You'll be fine. Right? These are just walls of coping mechanism. And I can't tell you how many times I've seen these people come into therapy and when they finally get down to the true self through the emotions they feel, there's a wound. We all have it. We look at the decisions our clients are making based on their self-concept. Okay, if I think I'm worthless, maybe I keep dating people who treat me like I am. Um, if I think I'm worthless, maybe I work harder than anybody I know because I'm really trying to prove my worth and I'm exhausted and I'm having a heart attack because my body is failing. Okay, all these things are connected. They're all connected. And we're looking at pleasure and pain associated with decisions. Okay, well, you've made these decisions in your life. How are they working out for you? Again, this is the psychotherapeutic model. It's far deeper, right? We're going to look at depression through a very deep lens. We're going to be using those flow charts I just showed you. Where are the wounds? Where are the self-concepts associated with those wounds? And let's get to those. We're going to start healing the trauma and reintegrating it. What does that mean? Well, it means once I've talked through the trauma and I've moved past the denial, like this really happened to me, um, very often sexual trauma takes years for people to admit. It's so humiliating. It's so degrading. And it takes us years to finally say, okay, this happened to me. And I've been living with this ever since. Well, now we can start reintegrating it into the adult brain because I've got a fully functional brain as an adult. And now I can start making sense of this. This wasn't my fault. This doesn't make me dirty. That's what we mean by reintegrating. We use our adult brain to become aware of what's true. So we talk, we process the trauma. We might use something called EMDR, which is um, eye movement desensitized. Uh, oh, the, an ac the acronym is escaping. Desensitized and reprogramming, reprocessing. So what we're going to do is use bilateral stimulation. And literally, when you're doing EMDR, your eyes are doing this. I don't know if you can see my eyes on the screen, but you're moving back and forth and back and forth. And what that's doing is it's forcing the trauma, the thought process, to jump over the hemispheres of the brain. And that's how we work it out. It's very, very effective treatment. I'm trained in brain spotting. And I won't go into what that is, but again, it's a trauma treatment. What we're trying to do in psychotherapy is not just help you manage the symptoms. We're going to give you tools for that, but we want to get to the root cause and we want to heal the wound. Okay. So we're correcting skewed belief systems and now we're making different decisions. Okay. If I really believe that I have inestimable value, how do I live my life? Who do I choose to surround myself with? My tolerance for being mistreated just went from this to nil because my self-confidence has been restored. See, this is the work of the therapeutic model, much different than the medical model. And there's nothing wrong with the medical model. It's just a different process. Sometimes we need both. Sometimes we need medication to just get the symptoms under control so we can do this work. But we have to engage this work if we want to be freer. When we make changes in our current life to match our true self, we're free or freer from the effects of the unhealed trauma and the abuse. So outcome models, the medical model, you're gonna get some symptom relief, but the studies, all studies on the long-term use of antidepressants are not good. Our tolerance for them increases, the dosage therefore has to increase, the efficacy diminishes, now we're switching medications, we're going from Wellbutrin to Zoloft to Lexapro, we're trying different ones because our body is getting too used to the one we're on and it can create some dependency specifically um, some anti-anxiety drugs that fall under the realm of benzodiazepines. They're highly addictive. They're extremely hard to get off of. What we need to do instead is be looking at those root causes and dealing with our pain. These are not cures. These medicines don't cure anything. It's just temporary symptomatic relief, okay? No one who takes antidepressants winds up with no depression. If you want no depression, you have to know yourself. You have to get into it and do the work. And if we can't eliminate it completely, we can do pretty well to get it to get it resolved. Outcomes of psych psychotherapy, you're going to get symptom relief, but you're also going to get increased self-knowledge. And, and it's different. Instead of just canceling out those symptoms, you're going to get relief because you're healing, right? You're, we're inviting God into the pain. We're inviting God into the darkness. We're healing through the therapeutic method where it's restoring our joy, our faith. Healed people are actually very healing agents to others. 
new behaviors become patterns. Now we're making better decisions. Okay, we're learning to expect the best in our lives and personal growth becomes a way of life. We're getting used to looking at ourselves, owning our pain. We're very emotionally honest. We're building more authentic relationships. So depression is getting further and further and further in the rear view very often. Okay, that's a much more hopeful model. Sometimes we need both and there's nothing wrong with both, but the psychotherapeutic work is the deeper work. Okay, so seeking and getting good help. First thing we have to ask, is there a problem? Um, I'm gonna click on this link and I'm gonna take us to what is a very, very famous um, depression inventory. What do we mean by that? It's just a test you can take to see if you're depressed. It's called the Beck Depression Inventory and hopefully this will follow. Good, it did. So every answer has um, multiple, every question has multiple answers. You can, you can take this at home and self score it. You know, there's 21 questions. I feel sad. I'm discouraged about the future and everything's on a spectrum. Okay. How sad do I feel? How discouraged am I? All of those things. Am I guilty? Do I feel like I'm being punished? Am I disappointed? Do I feel I'm worse than everybody? Am I crying? Am I irritated? Have I lost interest? Okay. So we go through all of these questions. We answer them on a Likert scale. That's what that call. That's called one to zero to three. And then at the end of 21 questions, um, we score, and then you'll see on the bottom, um, one to 10, these are ups and downs of life, 11 to 16, mild, eh, you pay attention to it, you may not be running to a therapist's office. 17 to 20, you wanna be paying attention, go talk to someone. Anything above 21, go to therapy. Talk to someone, find a good therapist, and go to therapy, okay? Hold on a sec, I'm gonna bring us back to the PowerPoint. All right, how do I find a good therapist? Um, I wanted to share this with you before we finish up. And again, I'm going to go over a little bit. Clint, please forgive me. Um, first thing, of course, you're considering is logistical. How much does it cost? Distance, comfort setting. Do I have insurance? Will my insurance pay for it? Um, do I want to be in an office? Do I want to be in a private practice? Do I want to be in a group? Okay. Then personal preferences, gender, sexual orientation, race. These are all important things to consider. Professional considerations are, does this person have experience and skill with your presenting issue? Ask. Okay, grief counseling looks like depression, but it's not. And I do a lot of grief counseling. I'll have people that come in and they feel like they're depressed, but then I find out what's going on in their life. And as it turns out, they just lost their husband. They just lost their spouse. Something has happened. They're in a grief process. So they need to know, okay, Vanessa, do you counsel people in grief? Yes, I do. Do you counsel people in depression? Yes, I do. Okay, but you have to ask those questions. And then further considerations, the therapist's commitment to their own healing and growth. I myself would never sit with a therapist who hadn't done their own work. If I, if I ask a therapist, are you a client? And they tell me no, I'm moving on to the next one. Or have you been a client? No, not really. I'm moving on to the next one. 12 step recovery is a good sign. And the reason why is the 12 steps are not easy. If you have a therapist that's worked the 12 steps, they've really taken a good look at themselves, okay? So case studies, and we're gonna finish here. I'm gonna tell you three brief stories and then we'll wrap up, okay? The writer, and all of these clients gave me permission and I won't share any identifying information to protect their confidentiality, but I did wanna tell you about these. Um, this client came to me and his words to me were, I don't feel anything, everything is gray. Grown man, middle-aged, high danger zone for depression. He wasn't suicidal, but he was pretty flat. Everything was gray. I'm not happy, I'm not sad, I'm not ecstatic, I'm not, I'm just, I'm not on the bottom floor. In other words, he was depressed, but he wasn't on the bottom floor. He was just nothing. So we started talking and I learned all about his family system. He had a very narcissistic father and he was never given the love that he needed from his dad. And then something very interesting happened about six months into our therapy. He started to tell me about an experience he had in school. And it took him six months to get there because there was so much shame attached to this memory that he had to develop enough trust in me that I could handle it. And he told me about some of the most vicious bullying I've ever heard of in my life. And he was a young teenager. Now, this man, when I met him, was a grown man. He was in his 40s. Uh, he was probably 6'3", maybe 190, 200 pounds. I mean, he's a he had large stature, muscular. He was a tennis player. He was very, very, very strong physically. But he was a late bloomer. And when he was little, he was 
mercilessly bullied and beat up at a private school where they thought that hazing young men was how you became a man and no one protected him. And I watched a grown man sit in my office and weep for the first time in his life and let that little boy finally feel his pain and his humiliation. So what needed to get unlocked was his pain and he wept. And he came back in again and he wept and we worked through the belief that he had developed about the bullying, which is, I'm weak. He was never weak, but that's how he felt. So about eight months into our therapy, but maybe three, four months, maybe two or three months after that breakthrough, he came in and he said, you've ruined me, Vanessa. You've absolutely ruined me. And I said, uh-oh. And I was sort of new in the field and I thought, oh no, what did I do wrong? And he said, um, I can't look at a flower without seeing a flower. And he just started crying. And he said, I can't hear a song without hearing the song. I can't, like, my emotions are turned on. You've ruined me. Look at me now. And I knew at that moment our work was done. The depression had lifted. And the reason why is because he finally gave himself a chance to feel what that little boy felt. And the pain that was blocked was blocking the joy. Once the pain was unblocked, the joy came back. There's hope. The academic. This client is at the top of her field. Before she met me, I think she referenced she'd been to 13 different therapists. No one could touch her depression. No one could get through. She had a work situation where she was hired under certain, uh, certain um, conditions. And after a little while, she got a large sense of her identity from her work. She was a very, very successful person. And her work situation changed and the rules changed. And all of that identity that she got from being very successful at her job just drifted away from her and she was left with rage at this institution where she worked because she no longer had the stability and the comfort of her job. So what we had to look at, 13 years of clinical depression, nobody could touch. We finally got deep enough and I started going, wait a second, where did you get this idea that your work is your identity? Let's talk about that. And what we learned was that her father had a terribly traumatic childhood and used work as a way to never feel his own pain. So what did he do? He raised his kids to be hard workers. Work is everything. Never stop working. Work, 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 work. And what I was looking at in my office was a human doing, not a human being. And once this client was able to identify her true self, she's not just a worker and her identity does not come from her success. It comes from God. Once the pain of that was unearthed and she was able to finally feel her anger, her relationships took off. She has friends that stand by her side. She's able to talk to them. She can cry. This woman was blocked emotionally. Her emotions flow like a river now. God touches her heart daily in her devotionals. It's been amazing to watch. And finally, the single mom. Very depressed. Very medicated when we met. Her journey really took a turn in therapy when I put a mirror in front of her. And I said, tell me who you see. And she cried. And she basically said, I hate that person. And I said, no wonder you're depressed. You cannot hate yourself and not feel depressed. Over time, we dealt with why she hated herself, the abuse that she'd suffered, and again, the beliefs that she developed. And little by little, she started to look in a mirror and instead of seeing somebody she hated, she started to see someone who survived. And she started to see someone she respected. And then eventually she saw someone worthy of love. That woman is a changed human being today. She's joyful. She puts up with no abuse whatsoever. She will not take it. And it's been amazing to watch her not only find her joy again, but find her voice and all of those things are connected. So brothers and sisters, I want to leave you with this tonight, okay? Mental and emotional health is attainable. We have preventative care, which is we 
beef up our relationships by being emotionally honest and authentic and vulnerable. And then we give ourselves attentive care when we're not doing well. It takes both. Our health, physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual requires investments of time, energy, uh, attention, and commitment. This is our first responsibility before any other, right? Love your neighbor as you love who? Yourself. It's time that we break through these stigmas and through the silence, suffering our, in our own pain, in our own mind, and we're learning to deal with one another with compassion by bringing our true selves, our authentic selves, our emotional selves to one another. And we need and build supportive, healthy, affirming community. And this is the family of God. I love being with you. I love all of you. Even though I don't see you, my heart loves you. And I hope this has been helpful for you. Please feel free to email me any questions you have. And I look forward to seeing you again. Great. Uh, Vanessa, um, thank you so much for your, uh, your ministry to us and um, for anyone who's tuned in and um, uh, anyone who may tune in later as this is shared uh, through our relational networks. If this has opened up something in your heart, I hope that you'll reach out to us, um, to Vanessa. Yes, please. We would just love to connect with you. We would love to walk alongside you and to help steward um, all that this has opened up uh, in your hearts and minds. And um, just know that that is actually why we are here. <laughs> and we would find the privilege to walk alongside you. So uh, I pray that this has been a blessing to you, this series. And um, again, do share these on Facebook and through email as you have the opportunity to do that. But once again, thanks for tuning in. Vanessa, it's been a great privilege to host you. And um, I suspect that this will not be the last time that we uh, partner yeah. with you in some way. So thank you. Thanks. Uh, and our greetings to Nashville. <laughs> thank you. And greetings to you all. Okay, thank you. Goodbye. Good night.